Welcome everybody to the um, DRO seminar of the day. And today's speaker is Aleo Nevado. Aleo uh, received his PhD from the University of Bristol uh, at the Department of Computer Science. And uh, for quite some time now, he has been uh, working in the Department of Psychiatry in uh, Oxford, uh, where he leads together with Noel Buckley, uh, the Computational and Molecular Neuroscience Laboratory. So, Aleo, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, Cornelia. So, I am going to present a few. So, the, the um, title of the presentation is very general because I wanted to give a general <laughs> overview of the different things that we do or the things that we are most excited about. Uh, and this overview is going to go through a few of the projects that are currently active in the pro in the lab or that have been published recently. Oh, uh, the next slide, mm, please. Perfect, very good. So uh, now this is one of the studies that we run. <clears throat> so as, uh, as I guess almost everybody in the audience know the uh, GIVAS analysis to try to find associations between the genome and phenotypes is, uh, has produced a lot of results and, and it is continuing to, to identify more genetic associations of disease and suggesting what are the genes that are important in disease. But we wanted to see whether neural networks and AI could, um, could further give us some associations that are not detectable. Uh, with a traditional GIVAS. The reasoning is that a traditional GIVAS, it uses at its, at its core a linear model uh, and it doesn't systematically try to capture interactions and so on. So what we did here is a first step towards trying to find nonlinear effects. Uh, this was a study in UK Biobank. Uh, we were using as an outcome uh, family history, maternal family history of Alzheimer and paternal family history of Alzheimer that gave us between 25,000 or 12,000 uh, people with, with the outcome, um, depending on which one of the two outcomes was it, and then uh, the same number of controls. Uh, it was one-to-one -one, uh, matching control and cases. Uh, then what we we're going to do rather than, so because the, the, the neural networks have the current limitation that they need a lot of data to train, and also you cannot send the whole genome. Well, at this time, we could not send the whole genome to the neural network. Now we have another project where we are doing it, but uh, the, one year ago we didn't. Uh, so we were sending to the neural network windows of 50 single nucleotide polymorphisms, single little mutations in the genome. They were contiguous mutations. And that also gave us the advantage that it gave us a method to identify what are the regions that might be associated with the disease. Now, the first challenge or one of the challenges to solve is that what a neural network is going to do is it is not going to give you a p-value and a beta value like in a linear model. It is actually going to give you a level of accuracy, namely how accurate the neural network is on predicting the outcome given this input of 15 single nucleotide polymorphism. And then to be able to transform that into a machine able to detect significant genes, namely p-values at the end of the day and beta-values, what we did is to apply on top of the neural network a permutation test that can detect whether the accuracy with which the neural network predicts the outcome, whether that accuracy is above total randomness or not. And then the permutation test consists on running the neural network many, many, many times uh, after scrambling the data and comparing the accuracies that you get with that scramble data with the accuracy that you get with the 50 SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, when you don't scramble the data. Oh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, please. I, I keep pressing my own keyboard, but it's, yeah. so yeah, please go to the next one. This one, perfect. So here, what you see, what you get in the end is a Manhattan plot that looks similar but a bit different to the uh, Manhattan plot of a traditional GIVAS. The Manhattan plot is this blue diagram in the left. 
the x-axis are the different chromosomes, as usual. The y-axis are the p-values that we get from the permutation test. And then the height of every of the dots, how significant the gene is. Uh, the biggest dots are in APOE, which is a good sign because it, 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 it means that the neural network is detecting what it should. And then of all the other genes that we detect, we see that one third of them intersect are the same as in traditional GIVAS, while the other seem to be uh, seem, seem not to be present in a in a GIVAS. Often they have subthreshold p-values or other times not very significant p-values. And then the other two diagrams are simply a table of how a table of all the genes looks like uh, with the p-values and so on. So we run this with all the genes by sliding the window 50 SNPs across the whole genome. Uh, now, if you go to the next slide, please. So now, okay, we got um, a bunch of the SNPs that are already known by GIVAS, so that suggests that the neural network is not crazy and is doing what it's all. Uh, but then what are all the other genes? Are they any meaningful genes or are they the neural network is simply hallucinating, so to speak? So then the rest of the study, we dedicated it to very systematically running different tests to see if the, if the neural network is finding what it should. And if it is finding what it should, what are the additional things that it finds? So... If we run a protein-protein interaction network with, in this case, I, I, I think it was string, the string database, but the, there are others. What we find is that the, um, so yeah, the genes that we find are more interacting with each other at the protein level than what you should expect by chance, which is a good sign because if the neural network were simply throwing random results, they should simply be random genes that don't talk with each other. Also, another possibility is that these, these genes are talking with each other and they passed a statistical test that tests whether they talk with each other simply because that one third of them that are traditional GIVAS genes. By the way, they are 96 genes and 30 something are traditional GIVAS genes. What happens if we eliminate those 30 genes? Are the novel genes also talking with each other or not that much? And that seems to be the case as well. We get a p-value, which was the p-value in this case, uh, 0.2 something, I think it was. Well, anyway, it is significant as well. And then later with string, we can also test what are the pathways, the biological terms more associated with this network of interacting terms that we detect. And it seems that the two significant terms are cognitive disorders and disease of mental health with multiple comparison correction p-value, which is, is also uh, encoding. Uh, these analysis with the protein-protein interaction network with string is simply an example of the analysis we can run to first further validate the neural network and second see the biology of what we found. But we can run this test with other databases that are, are around out there. One is KEG, also very, a very standard uh, pathway enrichment database. There we get amyotropic lateral sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease itself as enriched. We also test wiki pathways, DCNet. Uh, we also test for which tissues, so the genes that we find in which tissues they tend to be uh, expressed and, and so on, also brain QTLs and some other tests. Uh, and all of them use it to show, yeah, the genes are what you should find, plus there are some other genes that are, are of, of interest. Can we go to the next slide, please? Then this is an example of the um, tissue enrichment. So it seems that if you look at all, all the different tissues, and compare their levels of expression per gene to the genes that we find, the genes that we find seem to be specially expressed in the hippocampus uh, and other um, parts of the brain. And then if you go a little bit further down the list, I think the other ones start, start to be uh, pancreas and, and some others. If you go to the next slide, please. 
I think this is another example of other of, of the databases. This database, this unit is specialized on grouping genes according to disease. And what we see is that our genes, uh, at least part of them, seem to be especially important for Alzheimer. Uh, we're already identified for Alzheimer. Uh, other ones are for schizophrenia, other ones mathematical abil ability. Later you have obesity, which is um, is uh, tightly linked to Alzheimer as well. So in summary, we are getting what we should plus an additional list of genes that can be tested further. Uh, now uh, we are continue working with this method because a problem that we detected recently is that there is certain variability on the results of the method when you run it over and over again. Uh, so if you run it one time, you get 96 genes, but if you chain the neural network and run it again, the 90 something genes that you get are not exactly the same as in the previous one, they intersect, but they are not the same. So now we are testing a number of ways to stabilize the method and to try to find the real consensus of genes uh, rather than simply the genes of a single run. Uh, if you go to the next uh, slide, please. And then this is other line of working that we are exploring, where rather than sending the individual SNPs to the neural network, you re you send the whole the whole gene you send the whole genome sequence. Uh, it is going to be a challenge to send the whole genome in one go, but we are experimenting with sending a window of base pair. What is, there are two great advantages on sending the whole sequence. One is that, that you can detect many more things. For instance, it is not important only the SNP, how it is statistically associated with the phenotype, but also what is the meaning of the gene on the neighborhood of the base pair because it, it is very different if the gene falls inside the coding region. I mean, if the SNP, the mutation, falls inside the coding region of a gene, if it falls inside an exon or inside an intron, if it falls in the transcription area of a gene, uh, also if it is falling, if it is mutating the codon, the three base pairs, in a way that it becomes a stop codon or a whatever, also codons, uh, have different speeds at, at which they are transcribed in the ribosomes and that can affect the, the expression level and also the folding of the protein. The, there is a lot of grammar going on in the genome. So it is sensible to assume that all that grammar, if neural networks are very good at extracting and using the grammar of the natural language, uh, the human language, uh, Possibly they should, they should be able to also extract and, and understand that grammar of the genome, whatever that grammar is. And the results of the different labs that have been applying uh, neural networks to the raw sequences, raw genome seem to suggest so, including results of our own laboratory. Here, what uh, I am showing is uh, one of the most impressive neural networks that do this. This one was published, uh, I guess, last year by, uh, and what they did here is they train a neural network with um, with data from many different cell lines, many different tissues, 5,000 different cell types of the human and 1,000 something of the mouse. Uh, many of these cells are the typical cell of whatever tissue. Other cells are uh, immortalized cancer cells of whatever. And then for each one of these uh, cell lines, what the neural network was trained to do is to predict the value of a number of genomic signals. In summary, four genomic signals. These ones are called uh, cage, uh, chip histone, uh, chip transcription factor, and DNAs. Uh, these signals have Theoretically or experimentally, when they come out of the wet lab, they have one value per base pair, and they look like the three tracks that you have in the bottom. So the x-axis is different locations of the genome, and the y-axis is the strength of the signal there. And each one of the signal correlates with a different genomic function or genomic process. For instance, cage 
although I am not an expert myself on these laboratory uh, techniques, but from my own, from my understanding, when I talk with these people, K seems to be proportional or seems to have peaks where transcription starts in the genome. So at the beginning of genes or at the beginning of exons and so on. Uh, Chip Stone uh, gives, gives you peaks of which are the areas of the genome where the chromatin, the gene is more exposed to transcription. Chip transcription factor, TF, tells you where transcription factors or proteins are expected to bind to the genome. And I think DNA was also where proteins are expected to, to bind. Uh, so traditionally, these signals where you had to run a very long and expensive laboratory ex experiment to get them for whatever cell line. But now with this neural network, it seems it is able to predict out of the box what is what these signals should be according to the genome with quite good accuracy. The three tracks that you have in the bottom are simply comparisons between the experimental signal, which is the green in the top, the signal from this neural network, which is the blue one in the middle, and the signal from a previous method, also based in a neural network, uh, that was, was the best method in 2020. But in 2022, the best method was the blue one, this other neural network. In the left, you simply have a diagram of what the neural network does. You feed the whole sequence at the top. Then you have a number of so-called convolutional and transformer layers. They are different types of architectures, how the neurons connect to each other. And then in the output, you simply have the value of the, the average value of the signal in that little window. Um, for whichever location of the genome you gave to the neural network. And the neural network reads around one quarter of a million base pair in a single window, but then predicts the value of these signals in the center of the window. Can we go to the next one, please? So then what we have been doing is investigating what this neural network can do and then expanding its capabilities to the to to towards the goal that is of most interest to us, which is to find genes that are associated with disease, special Alzheimer. What we see when using this neural network is that it already out of the box is giving us, even for individual people, uh, signals that are already meaningful of what, what is happening in each one of the individual persons. So in the upper left, what we have is how the so if each one of the dots is a given gene and we were exploring whether this neural network will also be used to invest to predict RNA expression such that for instance we can see when the RNA expression changes when compared to the RNA expression that you should expect from the genome so in the diagram we see that the average cake signal predicted within the coding region of a gene already out of the box correlates with the RNA expression of the gene when you get all these genes from the ADNI database. Um, then we started, we have started uh, investigating how we should modify this architecture uh, to take it towards the, the, the goals that we are interested on. So we are working on the hypothesis that the better than the neural, that the neural network is interpreting the genome, the better that we should be able to predict the, RNA, the, the average RNA expression. And in this specific case in the slide, we tried two different architectures. If we compare the correlation between this output of the neural network and the real RNA expression level in the in ADNI, what we see is the second architecture is a bit more, is a bit better, so, so you get a better correlation than in the first neural network. And this is only an example of two neural networks. Uh, this is, but we, we have continued with uh, architecture three, architecture four. So this is the typical path that you will follow towards optimizing the neural network for your objective. And then in the bottom, you have some other investigations where we see actually the, the orange diagram is the correlation for one of the architectures. The blue one is other of the architectures, and then in the bottom, in the histogram, we compare the distribution of correlations. In summary, 
this is the typical investigation of different correlations to see which one is more appropriate for your objective. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. And then this is simply an example of how one of the architectures work. So the original and former architecture was used to train on the um, reference genome, uh, but actually we would like to use it for the genome of, uh, of individual um, persons, which uh, will have two strands of DNA. So then we need to modify the architecture for it to have two different branches, which are the boxes at the top. Each one of the branches will receive the sequence of, of a given uh, one of the strands, either the, the chromosome that came from the mother or the chromosome from the father. Then later we have an operation, uh, a order independent con operation, because you need to design the neural network such that um, it respects the directions of symmetry of the data. So uh, in this data, it shouldn't matter in principle uh, what is which chromosome is which. Uh, and then later we have a common trunk of, uh, of layers uh, common layers in the neural network that fuse the information towards predicting either RNA expression or Alzheimer diagnosis. This is work in progress. Our idea would be to try to use this neural network in the same way as we used the previous one. Namely, we try to predict Alzheimer and then we put a um, permutation um, test on top to transform the prediction into a level of association or a uh, a significance level telling us which parts of the genome seems to be more associated with the disease. Could we go to the next one, please? Uh, yeah, this one I will skip it. It is simply to show as well how the signal looks like when we run it across the genome, but, uh, but I will skip it uh, in this occasion. Next one, please. This is we are also experimenting with, rather than sending the new, uh, to the neural network the preprocessed data for each participant, and the preprocessed data gets from, from the transforms the data that is coming out of the laboratory into the two so-called phase strands of the, of the DNA, namely the chromosome that comes from the father and the chromosome from the mother. But we were thinking that maybe there is some more information that could be missed in this phasing step. So we experiment a little bit as well with sending to the neural network the raw data itself. And the raw data looks like the matrix on the left. So what you have is a very large file where each one of the rows corresponds to a so-called read, which is a sequence of base pairs that was present on the, on the array that you were using in the experiment. Uh, and the, the columns represent the different base pairs of each one of the reads. And then the reads that appear in this file are the reads that were detected in your sample. Uh, so from these reads, you need to deduce what are the two chromosomes of the, of the participant. Um, at, in some points, it is a bit ambiguous. It is not absolutely clear what should be the correspondence between both. So we have been experimenting uh, a bit with whether we can do that step with the neural network or we feed the raw data to the neural network such that the neural network can figure out and learn how to process that data in the best way. The way we have been doing it is that we send windows of this raw data to a neural network, uh, which is represented in the middle. The neural network is a so-called autoencoder that tries to learn how to compress that raw data such that you, it is a bit like principal component analysis, the same concept, but non-linear, such that you preserve the important meaningful information in only a few bits, a few numbers, uh, and then you, such that you can send these few numbers to the other neural networks, to the informer. Uh, next slide, please. And here, this is the other um, AI work that we are doing with whole genome sequencing. So um, what we are trying to detect here is where there are 
uh, so-called so short tandem repeats in the genome. These short tandem repeats are regions of the genome where you have a little sequence of base pairs. It can be only five base pairs, but it can be 30, and they are repeated over and over again. This happens because there are certain sequences that physically they are simply prone to replicating them over and over. And from one generation to the next, they can even expand further and so on. And they are often associated with disease. So this is because they associate with disease and because they introduce a quite strong penetrant mutation into the genome, they are quite interesting to try to figure out what genes are associated with disease. Uh, an example could be Huntington disease, where you have a repeat that can be uh, copy-pasted many, many times in, in, uh, in, in a given uh, protein. And if it is repeated more than 50 times, I think, uh, was the threshold, then it is very likely that you will develop Huntington. If it is less than, than 50, then it is it is less likely to develop the disease. Uh, however, the problem with these repeats is that they are not that easy to detect, even when it seems that it should be trivial, but actually uh, it isn't. Uh, the biggest challenge is that the genome is uh, a very large data set. Uh, the data set, the, the genome of a single person is a few hundred gigabytes. If you compress it, uh, I think it is one billion base pairs, I think it was. Uh, so algorithms, traditional algorithms, have a very hard time at uh, systematically finding these repeats across the whole genome. Uh, so we have been, and many people has been proposing different algorithms, and they are never perfect on detecting where there is a repeat and where the repeat starts and finishes. But it is very important to know both things in order to exploit those repeats to find genes associated with, associated with disease. So in previous work, our cells and other labs, we have observed how able neural networks seem to be on detecting complex patterns in the DNA. For instance, in a previous work that I am not showing here, we were able to relatively easily get a neural network much better than all the traditional methods uh, on detecting uh, whether a given exon in a genome, in a gene, is going to be uh, canonically spliced or, or non-spliced in a given tissue. Uh, it was easy to do it at the time because it was this was three years ago or so when almost nobody had applied, well, actually nobody had applied, I know only another group had applied neural networks to that question. Uh, so, so it was a low hanging fruit. It was quite easy. Now there are more groups that are starting to apply neural networks. In this example, the, the objective is finding the short and the repeats. So uh, in, we compare what we did to see if our neural network was any better than the previous methods on extracting repeats is we got all the data sets out there where they have annotated very carefully uh, where all these repeats are. Uh, they were five different data sets. Uh, they are often called a disease data set, which are repeats that are often associated with disease. Other of the data sets are called CODIS, uh, one specific of the Y chromosome, one of a paper of Marsfield, and other one that focuses on repeats on promoter regions. Uh, in each one of the cells, well, each one of the columns is a different method. Uh, the neural network method that we train is the first column. And in each one of the cells, you have uh, three different values. They correspond, this, uh, this is a coefficient that says, indicates how well the repeat, the location and the length of the predict, uh, of the repeat that you are predicting uh, coincides with the location and the length of the real repeat. Uh, and then, you have three versions of this score. One of them focuses only the real positive hits that you get. Other one are the negative hits, main, namely, respectively, how good you are at detecting snips, I mean snips, repeats when there is a repeat. And the negative one, how good you are at 
saying that there is no a repeat in a region of the genome when there is no a repeat. But usually these two are average into a single jacquard coefficient, which is the one at the bottom of every cell, which I have highlighted in, in black and in green when the method of that column is better than all the other methods, which seems to be the case of the, of the neural networks. And here we are using a relatively standard neural network. So if we were if we were to iterate further on specializing the neural network for specifically repeats, we we are relatively confident this could be uh, improved. If we go to the next slide, please. Another, and then there are a number of different benefits that this neural network has. A rather surprising benefit is that it actually runs much faster than all these other algorithms. Uh, because all the other algorithms, they, they have like complexity n cube or, or whatever, while the neural network is always the same complexity in a, with a fit for what architecture. Other interesting and very useful feature is that the other methods, uh, if you start, so something that happens a lot in the genome is that uh, you can have repeats that are repeated like imagine 50 times, but then from time to time during evolution, uh, impurities are introduced into the into these repeats such that in some of the repeated patterns the pattern is not perfect there are a couple of base pairs that have changed uh, because of these insertions and that usually makes it even more difficult for traditional algorithms for detect them but it is those repeats can still be associated with disease because they are still screwing up the protein or whatever so it is important for the whatever method you are using for it to also be able to detect these impurities. Uh, we have been comparing whether the neural network is able to detect repeats in when you have these impurities, and that seems to be the case. Here you have different lines. Well, in the y-axis you have of a data set of 49,000 repeats how many of those were correctly detected by each one of the methods, depending on how many repeats, I mean, not repeats, uh, base pair impurities you were introducing into the repeat. These were uh, repeats where the pattern or, or windows of repeats uh, of up to 100 base pairs. It seems that if we introduce up to 20% of impurities, the, uh, the neural network method, the green line, is still able to detect the repeat still a bit uh, above the, the other methods. The next step will be to try to make this neural network output as well how much impurity you have in the repeat, uh, which is something that the other methods don't do, but a neural network in principle will be able to do. And uh, that will be quite interesting in order to refine the later linear models that you will use to identify whether the length of these repeats associate with a disease or not. If you go to the next one, please. And then this one is another example, another area where you can also use AI and nonlinear models, although here they don't have uh, so much of a benefit, but they can help a little bit. This is a typical proteomics biomarkers uh, study, where in this case we had a population again. Yes, perfect. So here I was talking about a typical biomarkers analysis where usually people use support vector machines, now a bit of random forest, which is totally fine. We were experimenting here with using a small neural network. If you go to the next slide, please. These were around 800 participants, the objective, and these ones were, uh, they had measured on each one of these participants the level of A-beta in cerebrospinal fluids, the level of phosphorylated tau, total tau, and also the ATN classification. Um, we were comparing, we were using different models, uh, depending on adding APOE or not uh, APOE or the different proteins. The objective here is to find 
to see how well you can predict uh, Alzheimer, not Alzheimer's disease, sorry, these different biomarkers, A, B, and so on, on the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, by using as inputs to the prediction model uh, a number of the proteins that you have in the protein panel. Uh, this was somalogic, uh, the version of somalogic that measures the concentration of 4,000 proteins in blood. In summary, what we found is that you have uh, the neural network was able to classify a little bit better than support vector machine and random forest, uh, but uh, simply a bit better. Uh, these methods, the better you can classify, uh, the more uh, the more the a bit more confident you can be that you are detecting the correct uh, proteins uh, in your biomarker, and then later after these rock curves and finding the area under the curve of each one of these biomarkers, you do further analysis to see how, what are the meaningful proteins that the classifier is using and how they cluster into different groups, what is the biology of each group and so on. In summary, with neural networks, we are getting a bit better accuracy than with other methods, but, but that's it. Uh, so it, they, they can be useful, but not groundbreaking in these uh, biomarkers uh, setting. If you go to the next one, please. Yes, and then this is another uh, another area where these new AI methods are working very, very well. And this is the, the first area where they started to be applied uh, already like eight years ago, uh, which is where the data that you want to analyze is imaging data. It can be brain imaging, uh, imaging of any organ, CT scans, and in this particular example, it is microscopy images of uh, IPSC cell cultures that have different genotypes. We are not the only group doing this at all, um, but the other groups that are applying neural networks to this type of data, they are also uh, finding great use on them. In this specific setup, what we wanted to do, we wanted to try to design an experiment where we can measure uh, the effect of a long panel of drugs. Usually the way people does it, or one way, uh, one rough way to do it is that you have the, the your cell culture of IPSC cells that have come from patients, or you have introduced some mutation for the cells to be sick, or you expose these neurons or microglia or astrocytes to a, a beta itself. And then usually what will happen is that a proportion of them uh, die. And then what you do is to introduce each of a long list of a long library of compounds, and you see whether that, that effect, that phenotype, namely whether neurons dying, whether you are able to reverse that phenotype by introducing each one of these compounds. Uh, the problem is that that phenotype is very strict. You have to kill part of the neurons, uh, but before killing the neurons, there are also many aspects of the morphology of the cells that do change. Uh, traditional software, what it will do is to try to find the size of the cell body, the size of the dendrites, and up to typically 6,000 different features. Uh, and then you can detect whether each one of these features changes as a consequence of a beta exposure and whether your drug is able to reverse that change. The problem with that setup is that you have to work first on the hypothesis of what are the morphological features that change, uh, which has a number of problems. Then you have many, many features whose uh, whose identity or meaningfulness is not clear, and still those 6,000 features, they don't fully, uh, you don't have guarantee that they, uh, that any morphological change that happens in the cells as a consequence of the phenotype of A beta uh, is going to be reflected in the features. So what we were doing here is to see, sending this to, or training a neural network to detect all possible changes that the cells might uh, have as a consequence of the exposure. Uh, we have tried different exposures. One of them is introducing with CRISPR 
uh, mutations in APOE, clustering, uh, and so on, uh, the mutations that are associated with disease, and then detecting uh, how those cells change their morphology, usually they look more unhappy, uh, and whether you are able to reverse that uh, disease-associated morphology by using any of a number of drugs. The first step here is to get a new, to train a neural network to detect that phenotype very, very well. In this example, the phenotype was different dosages of A-beta. Uh, the dosages were zero, which is known A-beta, 0 0.1 uh, micromolar, I think it was 0 0.3, 1, 3, and 30 micromolar. We trained the neural network to predict what was the concentration uh, use in in that given aside in that given image of the microscopic image of the cell uh, by using as an input only the image of the cells and then we have bright field which is simply what you see from the microscope without any uh, any any add-on and also a number of, of fluorescent dyes that mark specifically the nuclei of the cells or the dendrites, or only some of the cells. This was, we were running these on different cell types like neurons, microglia, and astrocytes. What we saw is that the model was very good at predicting what was exactly the dosage of A beta. It was much better than even the two uh, postdocs, the biologists that were running the experiments themselves. So uh, this is very useful because then when you expose these cells in addition to any of a, any drug of a panel of many drugs, because the neural network is more accurate on detecting the morphology associated with the disease, you should also be able to, you, you will yourself be more accurate at detecting when a drug is reversing that chain in morphology. More accurate than even if you have a poor postdoc sitting through every one of the single images of the cells. And you can do this with millions of images because the neural network ne never get, uh, gets tired. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. And then here we were testing different, uh, what else you can do with a neural network to better understand what is happening. Uh, in each one of these rows, we have uh, the, the neural network model being fed with different channels of the microscopy setup. Sometimes when we feed all the channels, then the neural network is, is of course, very able to predict uh, the, 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 the dosage of a beta uh, up to 90% accuracy. But then when we start showing only some of the channels, uh, we see that with some channels, it is not possible to detect the, the dosage and with other, with other channels, it is possible. For instance, in this case, the neuronal channel uh, doesn't seem to do the job, but the, the nucleic uh, channel, the channel that, uh, that is able to mark specifically the nuclei of the, of the cells seem to be able to classify much better, which inform us of which are the parts, which are the structures of the cells that are changing as a consequence of the exposure, of the a beta exposure, or whatever simulation of the disease, uh, which can allow you, can inform you of what might be the biology behind the, the, your exposure. Uh, next one, please. And now this is initial work that we are doing uh, with, with uh, and now also with a PhD student, Holut. So what we are doing here is using also AI to be able to identify what are the brain regions associated with Alzheimer's. Of course, everybody knows that hippocampus is the, the first or one, the main region most commonly associated with Alzheimer's because it's where, where you have most of the, of the, of the of the degradation of the neurodegeneration but we want to see whether there are some other areas that also show anomalies earlier in the disease or or in parallel to the hippocampus but that are not typically found uh, because one of the problems of the current methods is that what you can systematically measure across many many people is usually the volumes of each one of the of the brain areas while a 
uh, a neural network, uh, they should be able to also detect patterns, changes in the patterns of voxels of, of the, the, each one of the structures of the brain. Uh, we are not only doing this with the obvious phenotype, which is Alzheimer, but also with setting up as a prediction outcome each one of the genotypes of each one of all genes under the sky with the idea that this might allow us to see which are the brain structures that might associate with each one of the genotypes. Most importantly, for instance, with APOID. What we have observed is that if we use standard approaches that test what is the volumetric change of each area um, as a consequence of, of the genotype of a gene, you detect very few areas, but uh, or, or you don't detect any for many genes. But with the neural network, we are able to detect many more areas as uh, significantly associated with the with the with the haplotype of the gene. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? And then this one, I think I will skip it for the sake of time. Here we were using neural networks to identify what is the best medication for each particular uh, particular patient of Alzheimer. Uh, but it was more epidemiology, also using AI, but I will skip it for today. Now, this is some other very exciting work uh, that we have done very recently, where sure everybody is aware of uh, the large language model neural networks and how well they are able to understand language and do a lot of stuff with language. Uh, and the next obvious step will be to start using these neural networks in health. A very important use case will be to use them in electronic health records because in electronic health records from hospitals and GP practices, they usually have most of the, most of the information written as free text, which you cannot analyze with traditional, with traditional methods. You have information such as the medications that the patients were taking, the, the symptoms, when they had the disease, when they had every surgery and anything that you can imagine. And most of the time, that information is only on the text. So these big large language models like ChatGPT4 or Cloud2 should be able to extract that quite easily. But the problem is that these neural networks occupy like um, hundreds of gigabytes of memory. And you need a very specialized server with many GPUs simply to run it. Uh, and also, if you that's one of the disadvantages. Other one is that if you want to get your neural network specialized on your medical text, you will need to fine tune it, uh, which is training it further with your data, and that's super slow. These are simply two examples of why these large neural networks cannot be applied yet to electronic health records. In 10, 20 years' time, it should be possible to put them even in a mobile, mobile phone, but not yet. So. To solve one of these problems, what we have been experimenting with is using a technique called uh, called prompting, which is very similar to what everybody does with ChatGPT. But if you use it in a given way, it allows you to specialize your neural network to a given setting, to your data, but without retraining the neural network. What you do here in the diagram, you have the representation of the neural network as with different layers. The key thing that you do, or if you go to the next slide, the key thing that you do is that you send to the neural network a prompt. For instance, the patient is complaining of severe, uh, severe uh, chest pain, or you can leave part of the prompt as empty, as a wild card. Mm, for instance, in this case, it will be the patient is complaining of and then a wild card. And you train the neural network to read the whole history of the patient and then predict what is the value of that wild card. And if you train it with this sort of prompt uh, fine tuning, you will be able to get a neural network which is very good at creating these predictions, but you train the neural network very, very quickly, uh, orders of magnitude more quickly than if you were using the standard fine tuning. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, please. 
Uh, the next one. Oh, this is the previous one. The next slide, please. Well, in summary, maybe I will describe it while we get the slide. So in summary, what we see is that with this prompt fine tuning, the neural network seems to perform even better than in, if you fine tune the whole architecture. Uh, and, and it can be done uh, orders of magnitude more quickly than, than with the standard fine tuning method. Uh, and yeah, that's everything. Uh, in the last slide, you will have a very pretty picture of all the pretty faces of the people of the lab. And yeah, and many names of everybody that has been involved with different aspects of these projects or with other projects that for the sake of time, I haven't been able to present today. Thank <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Leo. That was a very exhaustive overview. So I think there uh, are no questions yet I see in the chat, but um, perhaps can I kick off with the first question? If you, if you look at your, um, analysis that you have done comparing your analysis with genome-wide association analysis, right? Mm. Um, to what extent do we get a better prediction? Do you have any uh. question? Because I think there are people, for instance, um, uh, Valentina Prescott, Escott Price, who, 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 who finds already very good predictions with the, the GWAS data. Yes, yeah, so that's a very good point. Um, something that we should really do with the work with the sliding windows, we haven't done it because there we get predictions for one window at a time. But with other work that we are doing with Taiyu, another postdoc of the lab, we are sending to a neural network the whole genome. And there he was presenting yesterday the accuracy he was getting for diabetes but I don't know it from memory. So uh, so yeah, we get a level of accuracy, but I don't know from memory how much, and I don't know how it compares with the polygenic score or with what you will get with a random forest. Thanks a lot. Any questions from the group? I don't see anything in the chat box yet. So, what is interesting to use the neural networks in uh, sequence data, right? So, so how, how big are the samples that you can read in now? Is that? So the biggest neural network is one quarter of a million base pair uh, with the informer. They train it, I think, in three, no, 10, 10 GPUs of 30 gigabytes each. So with a, in our server, we can do it already. Uh, and you can also run these neural networks if you use DNA Nexus. Also, in DNA Nexus, it will be a bit expensive. But you will need to use windows of base pairs, like one quarter of a million, or it will still be a challenge how to send the whole genome of whole genome sequencing. You can send the whole genome of SNPs, but whole genome sequencing we have to put quite a bit of thought into how to do it. If you don't face the data, or do you face them now? You face them. Well, now I think UK Bear Bank, it is face now. So we, we will face it. We will use face data. Okay, I see two questions in the chat. So the first question is of Masoud Hussain. Um, do you want to ask it yourself, Masoud? Or yeah. Masoud? Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, Alejo, so thanks for giving us that overview. Um, but I just wanted a sort of big picture view from you about where do you where do you really think the major developments will be using neural network models for Alzheimer's? Where do you see it? Because you've presented many things. And the second thing is, um, I guess, wearing my clinical hat, is, is there something that could be more directly used in patients in clinical practice from this kind of work? So neural networks in general, where they should have a very good impact is one is analyzing the genome because there is a very complex grammar that traditional methods cannot go through, but neural networks can, and imaging data, all types of imaging, uh, like CT scans, MRI, 
and also signals. David Clifton is doing a lot with signals, like electrocardiograms, EEG. A lot can be done, and what is not being done is simply because of lack of people, <laughs> namely funding, and hands hammering keyboards to write on the neural networks because they are really low-hanging fruits. Uh, and also, the other thing you need is a lot of data for each modality for now. In NLP, it will be just just now you could use it for electronic health records, but you would the bottleneck there will be really getting the ethical approvals and the people that owns the data, the electronic health records, and that grab them very, very tightly from my experience for them to give you access to the data, install a server with a few GPUs in the server where the data lives. And then you can run these Llama 2 and soon Llama 3 models, three versions of ChatGPT. You could run them straight away and extract a lot of information. So Technologically. That, thanks, I can understand that from the yes. NLP. But, but going back to the genes and the imaging. Hmm. So, for example, if you look at UK Biobank, there have been several studies looking at APOE4 and relating it to the imaging. Hmm. So well, how do you think having neural network models would improve what we already know in terms of, let's say, APOE4 and hippocampal volume or whatever? Do you, you think there could be more subtle things if we link APOE4 to other genes that might be influencing uh, yes. the hippocampus, for example? Yes, so I think so, because there will be there are many, many patterns in the DNA beyond simple SNPs and simple sort and repeats and copy number variations, which current methods don't detect too well. Things that what I usually think for, think about is like little mutations or very infrequent mutations, how to get a method that distinguish whether the mutation should be should do nothing to the protein, to the structure of the protein, for instance, or should actually totally change the structure of the protein, which would be quite meaningful towards discerning whether a gene is associated with Alzheimer or not. Because if you get a mutation that totally changes a protein, but that mutation doesn't seem to change the probabilities of Alzheimer, then it is less likely that that protein is actually associated with the disease because when you mess it up completely, it doesn't really seem to change the the, the outcome. Does it make sense? Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. There's another question of Lailu. So the question is, could you please talk more about details uh, using NLP, such as chat GPT, uh, in your work in general? Yes, so we have been working so far with the smaller models because of the problem that everybody except Google and Open and OpenAI and so on have, that is that we don't have enough GPUs. But now we ourselves are receiving bigger GPUs with much more RAM memory. So we are going to start using cloud um, Yama 2 and these models that have billions of parameters. That's ourselves. Other teams, I think they, as soon as they can, I guess these other bigger companies that have the deepest pockets, they will start applying these NLP models also to health and medical techs. They, they, had, they tried around one decade ago, but they, they had some problems with ethical approvals and they had to abandon it. Now they might give it a try again. Technologically, it is very possible to do a lot of things with text. I think the roadblocks might be on the ethical approval, actually. Because it's identifiable data. Is that what you think? Well, you can make it, they identify it with these very neural networks as well. But you will need to convince the ethical approval committees and also to convince yourself that you 
run your neural network in such a way that the medical data stays safe. So it stays behind firewalls in the servers, that, that the data is not moved out of the server. I think it is doable, but you will need people working on it. I, I, I think that's it simply. You need people working on it and dedicating time. Um, I hope that answers your question, Lei. Um, any other questions? If not, I suggest we're a little bit running over time already, so we have to close the seminar. And uh, thanks a lot, Aleo. It was a very uh, large and extensive number of topics uh, covered, but I think that is also the reality in, in AI. It's going to affect us, most of it, in different fields of neuroscience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the YouTube invitation and everything.